Do you need a sharp sword to train historical martial arts? Hello there, Martin here from Schildwache Potsdam. And let's get right down to the question. Do you need a sharp sword to train historical fencing or historical European martial arts, i.e. HEMA? Well, not really. And that is not only my conclusion from a modern perspective, but also from an historical one. And by the way, this sword, while it's beautiful and it's really stiff and doesn't have really blunt edges, it's not sharp, right? So it doesn't have a point and it doesn't have really a sharp edge to it. But of course, uh, if you swing hard enough, you could cut something with it. But, okay. Like we usually do on this channel, we first should take a look at the historical sources. And on this channel, we mainly focus on the Bolognese sources. So these are the Renaissance masters, especially from the 16th century from Bologna in Italy. And there we have four to five sources, uh, depending on how you count. And two of these are actually talking about training with a blunt sword or training with a sharp sword. And actually they are contradicting each other just a bit. So these two sources are Antonio Moncellino on the one hand and Angelo Vigiani on the other. Okay, let's get into Moncellino first because he published his Opera Nova a bit earlier in 1531 that is. And he talks in one chapter where he's a quite strange dude in his kind of writing. He really wants you to know that he's uh, an intellectual. So he goes like a bit on, on the metaphysics line that he says something along the lines that your hand only uh, needs to understand the art of fencing and it doesn't differentiate if it holds a blunt training tool or a sharp one. Basically, okay, so you still are able to do all the proper movements with a blunt sword, he says. And obviously, since a blunt sword leaves you and your training partner quite a bit safer, that's the proper tool to engage in learning actual fencing. Okay, so this is the one bit. The other bit is Angelo, uh, Angelo Vigiani. Like I said, another Bolognese uh, historical fencing master who, who finished writing his uh, manual in the 1550s, but his, um, his manual got published only after his death. So it was published actually in 1575. So he writes in a like um, dialogue kind of way that fencing with sharp swords is actually of the essence. Why? Well, you might think it has something to do with binds or something, but that's actually not a thing at all. It has just something to do with uh, psychology. Okay, so he says something like you can only build the proper valor you would need to have in a real duel by also training with sharp swords, right? So only train with sharp swords, that's the real deal. And in only training with sharp swords, you will actually perform the actions in a way that are more resembling to the real deal, the real duel or a battlefield context. He especially mentions that with sharp swords, the parries and actions are quite a bit wider. So you, in your parries, you want to go like not only for the uh, opponent's sword to just miss you, but you're a bit more risk averse, you're calculating a bit more, you're parrying it a bit more outwards. And therefore, all your actions and actually the, the actions of your opponents get a bit longer which um, also affects like uh, reaction times and anything. So you are a bit more able 
to react to your opponent properly and to you recognize these tempies, these uh, optimal moments to attack your opponent where you are safe and the opponent can't hit you while you are, of course, hitting them. Okay, so Vijani argues from a psychological point of view. Okay, methodical? there's actually not really an argument to be made. And I would be really happy if you, as my viewers, um, may have read other sources than I did. So I usually um, read like the very early sources like 133 or the Walpurgis Fechtbuch and then Fiore, Vardi, etc. A bit of the Licht in our tradition as well, because I am German after all. Um, but Mainly I focus on the Bolognese sources and that's my shtick, right? But maybe you found something about sharp or blonde swords in the later sources as well. And it would be really interesting to hear about it. So leave a comment in the comment section. All right, but from a modern point of view, do you need a sharp sword? Well, you could certainly argue that learning to cut with a sharp sword is quite a challenge in itself and to be a complete martial artist who really knows how to handle the historical weapons, we would also need to be able to cut something. And actually, yeah, I agree. You need to at least once or twice in your life to make uh, to have some cutting test and if you have someone you trust you can even like playfully explore how sharp swords uh, behave like when you're having contact sword on sword or maybe even sword and shield and sword and armor this is a really useful experience but of course, it comes with some, with some risks that you have to manage, all right? And there are certain ways that make this risk quite manageable, like the Black Fencer Sharps, for example, that I reviewed in the last week. So you might want to check out this video as well. Okay, but cutting tests. Do they teach you cutting? cutting tatami mats or like uh, water-filled bottles or anything. And I would argue, no, this doesn't really teach you cutting at all. It's really, it's a test. It's a test of your already developed skill. The skill of cutting is, you could read a lot of good, great books on this feature and I uh, will link a couple of them in the video description below. But basically, cutting is a function of the weapon speed, the mass you put behind it, and the um, the surface where you make impact. All right, so it's like the the energy plays a, a critical role. So energy that's one half mass times velocity squared. So it's the mass you put into your weapon. And of course, your structure there plays a role as well, adding further mass to your to your object. It's the speed, the, which is squared, so it's uh, doubly important or it's squared important, okay? Um, and then the the impact area, and that's the basically the sharpness of your sword, and also the angle that your sword makes impact, right? And there are a couple of other factors that play a role in this, but Basically, it's getting your edge in line with your, with your cutting motion. And that's a skill that really doesn't need a sharp sword at all. Of course, you could argue, and actually Vijani does this as well, with a sharp sword, you very clearly hear if you're cutting flat, because if you're cutting with the edge right on, it makes a really sharp whis uh, whistle, whistling sound. So really hear this. But I would argue, even with blunts, you still hear this because if you go just flat, it makes like almost no sound. And if you're going like in the perfect angle, then you have this um, very satisfying swoosh moment. And so I think learning to cut 
basically is a skill that you mostly will practice uh, in solo drills while doing just your cuts like you do in the uh, sparring belts you have and then just listening to the sword and really paying close attention where the angle of your sword is because um, your eyes can actually deceive you, right? Because you're not really right behind the edge, so it's kind of hard to um, get the proper geometrical feel where the edge is in combination to the actual cutting angle. Because remember, we're, we're not just cutting from the arm, we're also turning our bodies, so it gets quite a bit more complicated. And sound is a really, it's a really nice feedback, basically. Okay, so cutting tests, it's more like a test of your solo practice. And I would also argue that this can be, well, not really de detrimental, but often enough, I see cutting tests that are really far away from the cuts that you would actually do in a fight. Like people with a sharp sword then already going step first and then like really going all at it with a huge cutting motion. Something that they won't do then in sparring where they go for really small motions and then um, taking these uh, like these successful cuts which are not really the same as they do it in combat and then say something about their cutting quality. That's not really cutting it. Sorry for that. Yeah, so if you do your cutting practice, make sure to do the motions as close as possible to the ones that you do in actual combat. Okay, and that's the last point I want to make. Do you need to be able to wield the sword to really injure someone? No. Okay. We are far from the time, luckily, where we have to use these swords for self-defense. So it's not really necessary. Just deal with it. Okay. It's, it's a hobby. It's a great hobby, but it is a hobby. All right. We are not reenacting the battles of old. We're not becoming the best sword men and women ever. So just deal with that fact, all right? And have some fun. That's the most important one, okay? Never let you, uh, never let somebody tell you what you have to do, okay? If you have fun cutting, do it. Go all the way. You have my, my blessings. You don't need them, but you have them anyway. Okay, so, so long. Um, do you need a sharp sword? Not really. Can it be beneficial? Maybe. I'll see you in the next one. Until then, ciao. Lightsabers, woo!